Thank you. Oh, what a nice audience. It's lovely. They must like you or something. <laughs> so, the first thing to say is welcome. Um, the second thing to say is that this event is sponsored by WWF, World Wildlife F Fund. Not the wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Um, a bit more interesting. Actually. And they've got a little stand outside. They would like you to fill in a campaign postcard. And the Scottish director is here. His name is Lang Banks. <laughs> and he will be in the Garden Bookshop Cafe afterwards if you want to talk to him instead of Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So Matt, so happy to have you here. Um, Matt Egg is the number one best-selling author of Reasons to Stay Alive, six novels for adults, many books for children, many of which have been awarded prizes. He sold more than one million copies of books in the UK, translated to 40 language, languages, and married with two children. <laughs> <laughs> I consider that an achievement. <laughs> yeah. So here he is to talk about the sequel to Reasons to Stay Alive. It's called Notes on a Nervous Planet. It's out in paperback now. Um, I want to say welcome first, we should say. Thank you. So instead of um, getting him to read from his book to start off with, well I thought I would do something slightly different. I'm going to ask him to read some tweets. He has 320,000 followers, correct? I think so. Yep. Sounds Apparently. A lot. And so I'm, I'm passing him four tweets that I want us to <laughs> hear. I never actually read. It's weird, like, because even though I have followers on Twitter, I, I always imagine no one is actually real on Twitter. <laughs> and I always forget. And I've never actually read out a tweet because I write them, but I wouldn't actually <laughs> read them out at a festival, for instance, but apparently I'm, I'm doing this. Okay. Don't so forget the date. The date. I won't forget the date. Okay. 13.08.2019, uh, 10.35 p.m. I sent this. Um, weird month. Had my writing pilloried in the right-wing media. Had my looks attacked by a hundred Daily Mail commenters. Been lied about in the press. And I actually feel better than ever. <laughs> it's not what people say about you. It's what you feel about you. And I feel good. That was a tweet. Um, shall I read all of these? Yep, tweets? yep. My entire timeline. This is... <laughs> um, this was 4-08-2019. So that's August, yes. Um, 11.53 in the morning. The Texas governor said the cause for the El Paso shooting is mental illness. It's weird because mental illness exists in every single country, yet America's lax gun laws exist in just one, the one with all the mass shootings. Maybe it's guns. Um, <laughs> uh, 07, 08, 2019, 08.59 in the morning, which will have been before my breakfast, probably. Um, and one of the reasons some men find it hard to seek help is that they feel deep in their soul that they are not meant to, that to seek help is to turn them into a person they have fought their whole life not to be. I tweet a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, and then... This, this is an embarrassing one, but I, I, as you suggested I read it, I will <laughs> read it. 0308 2019, 6.15 p.m. Her Royal Highness Duchess Meghan called me a force for change, so now I can die happy. I would love to go back in time and tell my young, hopeless, suicidal self about all this magic to stay alive for. Thank you. <laughs> It worked. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I was, a bit, I was very excited about the, um, that Duchess Meghan thing because I came home from holiday and amid all the um, bills and magazines, I had this handwritten note from royalty there and I was very excited and I got caught up in the moment and I went on Twitter to show off and it was, I don't know, it's a bit cringy. Just nice handwriting. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to come back to her in a minute, but congratulations on that, definitely. I want you to tell us about that. But what I want to talk about now is, is this book in particular, 
It's called Notes on a Nervous Planet, but I think it actually could almost be called How to, Sur to, How to Survive a Nervous Planet. And one of the things you say in this book is to deeply question the habits of the digital age. Take a break from it. Hmm? Um, you and you I don't do much of that, though, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hypocrite. Actually, let me ask you <laughs> a question. <laughs> so what, I, what you, in, in this book, talk a lot about, um, among other things, too, of course, is that the sort of the Twitter and the social media is this incredible obsessive loop and the terrible things that the, the world is throwing at us at great speed, which is obviously the, the nervous planet. That's what this book is all about. But at the same time, as is proved by your reading of the tweets, it's a brilliant medium for you. And so what, and it's in the same style as a lot of, of, of your books, too. So what I thought that was, I think there's such an interesting contradiction. Yeah, um, I have a love-hate relationship with it. It's like, I Twitter can, social media in general can be the best thing, it can be the worst thing. Um, the tale of two Twitters. Um, it is really, um, <laughs> yes, that was worthy <laughs> of a groan. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, I don't understand. I, I, I think there is an addictive element to it, which I don't like. Um, being an addictive personality. And, you know, I, I've read recently from, like, um, technology people in social media, and th they compare it, actually, to a lot of the mechanics of gambling and how, like, fruit machines mm. work, where you're literally pressing the button, wanting all the cherries to line up, wanting mm. cherries. You know, that scrolling down thing, scroll to refresh, scroll to refresh, wanting the next thing. I think, you know, and, and, and it's not accidental how... Um, social media, the successful social media sites are designed. They're designed um, to be addictive, even though that's, a, a, that's still a slightly controversial word in this area. But I think eventually they will be seen as potentially addictive substances. But like some other potentially addictive substances, there are, are um, sometimes things about it which make you feel happy or make you feel connected to other people. And there's definitely that element. And I, I, I'm... I'm 44 years old, so I'm old enough to remember the time before social media, and I rem even old enough to remember being published before social media. And it was very frustrating um, in terms of uh, how you communicate with readers, because essentially, unless it was a festival like this, you, you couldn't, and you didn't have much. The author-reader relationship was very distant. So it's, it's very good for that. It's very good for... Um, raising awareness of issues. Mm. Um, it's very good to not feel alone about mental health problems and things like that. Um, but the bad side, especially with the um, bad side of Twitter, is people tend to act like assholes a lot on Twitter. And it brings out your own, that own element of me, I feel, which is why when you said, oh, will you read some tweets out? I thought, oh, wh which which ones? Because <laughs> <laughs> some I wouldn't want to, um, and there's some you regret almost uh, after mm. saying it. So I feel like sometimes being good at Twitter is kind of like a backhanded compliment because it's like just being really good at being annoying. <laughs> but actually, I would say all of those things, yes, and it, you, and you talk about those things in the book too. But but also, it's an, it's a not just a good medium for you because you can communicate with people. But it's it's your writing style too, isn't it? Not all of it, of course. Oh, I like you know, I, yeah. I mean, I like um, I like simplicity. I like being able to translate things. Like it goes for back to the mental health thing. Like when I had depression, and I found it literally very hard to articulate anything mm. or to understand anything. And my big quest with my own recovery, to an extent from being suicidal to being not suicidal, um, was really a process of learning how to articulate what I was feeling in order to manage what I was feeling. And I, so I'm, you know, I, I did a master's degree. Before I had a breakdown, I did a master's degree at Leeds University. And no disrespect to um, that course, but I sort of learned to be snobby about simplicity mm. and snobby about things like plot and character and simplicity in storytelling and all of that. And I became quite a typical, pretentious, young MA student. And then I had a nervous breakdown. And suddenly, after the, uh, during my nervous breakdown, all I wanted to read was Winnie the Pooh. 
-hmm. and um, stuff that was on my um, bedroom uh, back in Newark on Trent because I was back living with my parents and my girlfriend Andrea and there was lots of children's books and I suddenly started reading all these children's books and um, I, I relished their simplicity and simplicity is not the same as ease it's not easy necessarily to write something that feels pure mm -hmm. and simple you know, it's the easiest thing in the world sometimes to be complicated because life is complicated and you can write down a stream of consciousness, anything, and it'd be super complex. But I, I like the challenge of actually not dumbing down but being able to sort of translate something as simply as possible. And Twitter, because of its word limits, character limit, it sort of forces you to be mm. succinct. So I like that. Yeah, yeah I can see it. It really is your medium. But as you say, it's the flip side is... Like anything really yeah. good, is the flip side is the really bad thing too, isn't it? Yeah, and I've had uh, lo lots of, yeah, I, I've had like loads of people, and I'm definitely not the person who gets most attacked on there. But because I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm a very like my fatal flaw is that I'm quite opinionated, but also thin-skinned, mm. which is a, a bad mix. <laughs> <laughs> for Twitter. Sometimes I think that might be the definition <laughs> of an author. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so just I want to go back a bit. So the reasons to stay alive indeed t t tells the story that, that you just talked about right now, which is going through a very serious crisis and then at the end deciding, well, not the end of the book, but the end of, of that period, deciding to live and then to really live. And you came out <coughs> and told this story, huge success, as I said, millions of copies. That must have taken you by surprise because you suddenly showed yourself to be very vulnerable to the world, a very important book for lots of people. And now you're the champion of mental health. And Ian, how does that feel? It sounds a bit scary because, um, yeah, and uh, sometimes like you get called ambassador, ambassador of like, men uh, like mental health ambassador. And then people say, oh, you can't say that because you're an ambassador of mental health. And I said, I never asked to be an ambassador. I don't, you know, I'll take the Fiera Russia, but I'm, I'm not, I don't want <laughs> anything else involved with this ambassadorship. Um, and it's strange because I'm, I'm not a doctor. I was never even in the Samaritans or anything. I'm just a person who had a story. I wanted to tell that story because I wanted to make other people who are going through something similar to feel less alone with that. And yes, I've sort of got some answers in that book, but they're, they're, they're subjective answers and they're answers for me. And that whole book really is just like a message in a bottle back through time to that person who was literally on a cliff edge and who uh, literally and metaphorically on a cliff edge and who uh, woke up every day wanting to die and I felt there would be no way out of that situation and the reason I was suicidal wasn't because I had a, a, a love of death or a death wish in that sense it was just I had no idea how um, to cope with living so that's I what I had in mind when I was writing Reasons to Stay Alive and I was in a very different situation in life, I was writing it from that future self that I didn't believe in when I was 24 years old to sort of like try and, and break through space-time and tell that person or the equivalent of that person that that future exists. So I had a very, very clear idea who my reader was. It was me when I was 24 years old. So it was very nice when you're writing anything to have an idea of mm. who you're writing it for. And do you feel happy to come on stage now? And um, no. Uh, <laughs> well, um, uh, this is all right, actually, because A, you're, you're friendly, I think, um, and B, I'm talking to you. And it's nice to talk to someone, because stupidly, this year, I did a tour. I, I agreed to do this theatre tour, and I had the option for it to be nice, like um, a conversation like this. And, and stupidly, I said, no, I will do um, it solo, because... I've got this thing with my anxiety where, where I'm scared of something, but I sort of want to do it, but I'm very, very scared of it. I think, no, I have to. I literally have to say yes to that mm. because otherwise it will build and build and build and become like a phobia. So I've been asked, you know, do you want to do it solo? And like, there was a tiny little part of me before, oh, that'd be really cool. And most of me was like, no way. That sounds like an absolute nightmare. Uh, and then I agree, uh, but I, it was like uh, still months in advance, so it was still like this hypothetical concept. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll do this um, solo theatre tour. And then after I said yes, I started to get more and more nervous about doing it, and I was having anxiety dreams about it. I kept on having one about Sam Smith, you know, the pop star, Sam Smith. He was playing at the O2, and he, for some reason he couldn't do it. And for some even wilder reason, <laughs> he phoned me. And I, I've never met Sam Smith, <laughs> and I can't sing. 
And um, I don't really know any Sam Smith songs. And he, he said, would you? So I was there having to be in front of like 20,000 people in my dream um, singing Sam Smith songs. And that's what was my anxiety dream for like every night for about five months, no, three months. And that, that was bad. And also, um, I told my mum that I, I, I was about to do these events, and she knows, because she used to be so worried about me as a kid, but she, she used to force me to um, speech and drama lessons and build my confidence up like that. And she even got me to play um, The Prince in an amateur production of Sleeping Beauty. And my sister was Sleeping Beauty, so I had to kiss <laughs> my own sister in front of my peer group at a, a, a pivotal <laughs> age in my life. and. Um, what else? Yeah, so <laughs> public speaking was always a thing for me, but also I think it's also cultural. We have a massive fear in Britain of public speaking. They did a survey in 2013, <laughs> the mm. largest of its kind, looking at the greatest fears of mm, um, the right. British public. And number one was the fear of losing someone you love. Number two was... Um, fear of public speaking, which technically is called glossoph glossophobia, so that's your word for today if you don't know it, um, fear of public speaking. That came above number three, which was your own actual death. <laughs> so <laughs> public speaking, this is worse than death. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about um, the, the, the phrase mental health, because it, it feels to me you know, you've talked about it there, actually, that it's, it's quite sort of bandied around these days. And, and it's obviously good, you know, that we're talking. So we've got Prince Harry and Ruby Wax and Alistair Campbell. And a lot of the comics on the fringe here are being very open about this sort of thing. But I just wondered, I want to ask you if we could just look at that word a bit more, because it feels to me like it's getting a bit shop soiled <laughs> and used kind of correctly because I well like sh mental health Oh yeah. because I see it's used everything from sort of lack of resilience to serious psychotic illnesses and or from people who feel a little bit blue to people who can't feel anything mm. and I'm just wondering do you think now we're at a stage you know since we're mental health is sort of discussed openly which is obviously great that we need new words for it we need I think there's confusion. Precise? there's confusion about mental health because the first thing about mental health is it's not mental illness mental health I think is just as in the way that physical health isn't physical illness. Physical health is some, you know, something we all have to look after and tend to. And so I think mental health is useful in the sense that it's broad, in the sense that it's non-specific, because it actually suggests that we all, you know, it is a universal issue. It's not a one in four or a one in three issue. It's a one in one issue. It's everybody has mental health. And um, going back to Twitter, there's a, a, there's a person on Twitter called Piers Morgan <laughs> who, um, who's improved my mental health by blocking me, actually. <laughs> kind of nice. But um, he, he says we should stop using the word mental health and start using the word mental strength um, because, you know, there's t too many people talking about mental illness. But I... I I thought how strange I was, because if you say, oh, we should stop talking about physical health and start talking about mm -hmm. physical strength, it just becomes this weird thing. And, you know, it's often associated with, like, manning up out of mm. mental health discussions. But I think it's kind of, like, sort of silly. But, I mean, we do need more specific words, I think. And I think what's interesting is, is the evolution of language. I don't think any of the terms, any of the labels we've got totally, um, totally fit what it feels like. Like depression in particular, depression for me, um, it never really, it, I don't know why, but that word never summed up what I was feeling. And I think because often the connotations of depression are slowness, mm. lethargy, the, the external idea of depression of seeing someone in, in a bed, not being able to get out of bed. And depression, as often as not, is coupled with anxiety. And anxiety, it's kind of the opposite of that. Anxiety is where everything is fast. So you might look like you're lethargic or slow on the outside, but actually what's going on invisibly inside is very fast. So, so just that alone, you know, just the word depression for me doesn't really sum up depression. And it used to be melancholia, and sometimes mm. I, I like that a little bit more, mm. but even that's sort of wrong, and it's got, you think of too many sort of romantic poets with that. But um, Have you found a word? No. Um, Brexit. No. <laughs> <laughs>
You did say, though, <laughs> it, well, I, I listened to you talk about that you wanted to say not mental health, but just health. Yes, I think so, because I think ultimately, in Utopia, which we're obviously heading towards, I, I can feel it. Um, well, we're in Scotland. <laughs> we're in Scotland. <laughs> yeah. um, I feel that um, there won't be that brick wall we have between mental health and physical health. Because when, when I was ill, actually, when I first had my breakdown, literally first having that first panic attack, it felt like something very, very physical, physical yeah. was happening. And there was literal sensations fluttering in my skull. You could la literally see parts of my body just like fluttering and shaking and quivering. And it was physical. And I don't need, even if you think mental health is just your brain, is your brain not physical? You know, I don't understand why mental health is over here and physical health is over here. I know the history of it and the Bible and Descartes and everything else where we, we have this sort of separation of mind and body. But it doesn't make any sense. And I don't think it's helpful in terms of stigma. Mm. I think if we, you know, because, uh, you know, famously men, for instance, are very bad at going to the doctor about mental health, but less bad if they've got like chest pain or something like that. And, you know, a lot of people, men and women, feel very uncomfortable talking about um, mental stuff and emotions and feelings. But if it was seen that that is as physical as anything else, mm. then it would become easier to talk about. There'd be less stigma. Um, the solutions would be more likely to come. Because um, I don't get the line. You know, I physical illness has mental effects. You can hallucinate with flu, a high fever. You can hallucinate. You can be feel lethargic because you, you of uh, any physical condition. So, yeah, I don't get the difference. So, bit and of a whoppy answer. So. <laughs> I showed you this. Um, there's a very good um, essay by Virginia Woolf. So about all that banging. Um, and Sorry? Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> there's a very good illness. Um, it's called On Illness by Virginia Woolf. And it, it, it interesting. She's talking about physical illness. But, of course, since we know so much about Virginia Woolf, you cannot help but read through it and think. But she has this... One thing that I yeah, should yeah, you, yeah, it's which great. is there, I there is, let us confess, an illness is the great confessional, a childish outspokenness in illness. Things are said, truths are blurted out, which is the cautious respectability of that health conceals. And I, I want to ask you about that. Is, do you find, like a lot, there have, you know, we have a real history too of artists, don't we? Virginia yeah. Woolf, Sylvia, Sylvia Plath, Dylan Thomas, Anne Sexton, and now Ruby Wax, Stephen Fry who have, through illness, have found their art. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting, because it, it, you have to be sort of delicate when talking about yes. this. Because I definitely think there is a connection. Certainly, like with my work, I feel like, so not so much depression. I find that depression can be just kind of useless, and you feel useless, and it's just, <laughs> and it does make you tired a lot of the time, and it is quite an unproductive state. But I feel like, and I, with me, I can only speak subjectively about this, I know everyone's different, but with me, like anxiety, panic attacks, that sort of stuff, that was a constant state of your imagination being switched on. Not switched on in a good way, mm. but you were catastrophizing, you were imagining all kinds of events that weren't going to happen, you were constantly questioning everything, mm. um, you know, every sound, ev everything, um, you were thinking worst case scenarios, and, and constant, constant, constant exhaustion. So I, I think there is some link there. And what was helpful for me about writing and certainly writing fiction. Which yes, is and you talk about being saved by stories. What, you know, that was the first kind of writing I did. Um, it was a way to sort of channel that same energy. So it, it, wa it was existing in a similar part of me. I mean, I'll say all that with the caveat that I do think um, it's, it's kind of unhelpful to, uh, you know, but there's uh, this whole cliche of mm. tortured artist, mm tortured rock star, tortured poet, whether it's... Uh, that you have to suffer to, yeah, to whether be Yeah, it, whether it's Shelley or Kurt Cobain or yeah. whatever it is, there's this idea, this is a romantic idea, and it was an idea that I had very much in my head when I was um, 24 years old. Because even though it wasn't that long ago, you know, two decades isn't that long, I think in terms of mental health, it has been quite long, because mm. 20 years ago, there weren't... There wasn't a massive list of famous people you, you could, not living famous people, mm. who were that That's open right. about their mental health problems. So who I had in my mind was Hemingway, Plath, Kurt Cobain, people who died yeah. from having depression. 
And when you're in a state of depression anyway, and you're catastrophizing anyway, mm. um, it is incredibly easy and dangerous to believe that that is going to be your trajectory. Mm. And if you're feeling like, as I was as pretentious 24-year-old MA student who was writing bad poetry, um, y you feel that, that that's my destiny. I'm one of the sensitive ones, and this is how what's going to mm. happen to me, and I'm going to die, and all of this. And because there wasn't that much public conversation, and I feel like that's a really dangerous thought. There's a, a quote by uh, David Foster Wallace who said something like, the most dangerous feeling he ever had in terms of his mind and depression, and obviously he ended up taking his own life at 44, which is my age, which was used to curse me. I used to think, oh, yeah, like, like, oh, it's just young people who, 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 who took their own life. Oh, no, but David Foster Wallace was 44, and now I'm 44, and I'm pretty sure I'm not going to take my life when I'm 44, so I'm going to get past that. Anyway, David Foster Wallace, um, he said something about the most dangerous thing was for him was when he thought he was special, when he mm. thought like it was like a, a gift, like some weird thing in his head. And I, I think it's not only a bit pretentious, but it is also actually dangerous to start thinking like that. Yeah, but like anything, as, and like lots of physical experiences and lots of physical health experiences, or like having a car crash, or like grief, or like any intense experience that happens to you, yes, you can use it. You can use it as fuel, and creativity helps, and there's lots of sort of uh, very official courses where people get people to um, write poetry about what they've gone through, act out plays and stuff, and I, I'm a great believer in the arts as helping with that. But I don't think it I, I, I'm resistant to thinking it marks you as this sort of special, tragic, slash mm. gifted, dark person. I think you're right. I think that's not a good place <laughs> to go. I think you should tell us about Meghan Markle. Um, <laughs> and what happened. I okay, we've right got, your yeah, good, yeah, no, got like a good handwriting, but after I that. I'm really, I can tell you what I can tell you about is the media, like the media are obsessed. Because I, I, I had a little, I, w I don't really pay attention to royal stories in newspapers. But then because I became part of it, because of Meghan Markle's Vogue edition, where um, I was uh, like, she chose a chapter, which I'll read in a bit, of, about um, the beach, beach bodies and body image. Um, I had a bit of it, and I was invited on um, this morning, and I foolishly like, said yes to go on this morning. And it wasn't even Philip and Holly, it was the, ov the other two, Eamon and Ruth. <laughs> and I didn't realize before I got on, but some of the people who'd been nasty about Meghan Markle were actually Eamon and Ruth, uh, apparently had been a bit nasty about Meghan Markle. And I didn't realize that. And I went on, and I, I was trying, because I was nervous, I was trying to be a bit funny. And I said, oh, I, and well, it's true, I was on holiday at the end of July in the south of France, and um, I had an email from my publicist, who's probably in this room somewhere, uh, at the uh, Canongate, Lucy, and um, she said, I'll be editor of Vogue, um, would like, uh, is including your extract in the new magazine, and would like to speak to you about it. And I thought, that's a bit weird, like a magazine editor um, wanting to speak to me. And then I realized that after the event, that Meghan Markle had been phoning everyone via Edward Ennefel, the mm -hmm. editor yeah. of Vogue, um, to thank them uh, for being included in this edition. And I didn't know that. I felt I was just ignoring a work phone call with a magazine editor <laughs> going in a swimming pool. So I joked my stupid way on national television that I ghosted Meghan Markle, which is it's not even the right use of the word ghosted. And also, it was just like declining a call. For I didn't know anything about Meghan Markle being in this edition. And then, like, the Daily Mail, Daily Express, The Sun, it was this uh, author or mental health ambassador, um, ghosts Meghan Markle, just because they want some sort of negative story. So and I spent the whole interview defending Meghan Markle, being nice about her, uh, saying about all this press attention, and I thought, oh, just, you, it doesn't matter what, you know, they have a narrative that they um, want, and the mm -hmm. press are going for it. And I just can't believe it. I mean, whatever you think about royal family, I feel like the causes they get behind, climate change, mental health, mm. body image, they're good causes. The royal family are meant to be doing good causes. The idea of making, I hate it when people say mental health is a political cause, or climate change mm. is a political cause. Is science, is gravity a political cause? You know, Do you want to read it? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll read it. And I'll, I'll say that, firstly, it's not a poem, because everyone, 
has called it a poem, and the Daily Express said it's the worst poem that's ever been written. <laughs> <laughs> so here is the worst poem that's ever been written. Uh, it's definitely not a poem, and it was me, like, because of the body image, all that are you beach body ready stuff that you see. That even men, uh, I know it's traditionally like women, it's been aimed at women all this time, but even men now, you know, there's all these adverts and internet stuff about having to have abs for the beach and all this ridiculous stuff. So I was just trying to do a bit of like copywriting from an advertising perspective if it was the beach writing it, but it's not a poem. So I just want to say that in case, I doubt there's that many Daily Express readers <laughs> in the audience, but just in case. Hello, I am the beach. I am created by waves and currents. I am made of eroded rocks. I exist next to the sea. I've been around for millions of years. I was around at the dawn of life itself. And I have to tell you something. I don't care about your body. I am a beach. <laughs> I literally don't give a fuck. I am entirely indifferent to your body mass index. I'm not impressed your abdominal muscles are visible to the naked eye. I'm oblivious. You are one of 200,000 generations of human beings. I've seen them all. I will see all the generations that come after you too. It won't be as many, I'm sorry. I hear the whispers the sea tells me. The sea hates you. The poisonous, that's what it calls you. A bit melodramatic, I know, but that's the sea for you. All drama. And I have to tell you something else. Even the other people on the beach don't care about your body. They don't. They are staring at the sea, or they are obsessed with their own appearance. And if they are thinking about you, why do you care? Why do you humans worry so much about a stranger's opinion? Why don't you do what I do? Let it wash all over you. <laughs> Allow yourself to just be as you are. Just be, just beach. <laughs> And did you want to tell us about, you had another poem, Snow Oh yes, Snowdrops. I do. I want to read you an actual proper poem, because everyone calls that a poem, and it's not a poem. It doesn't even rhyme. It's not a poem. No. Um, I've got a poem. I'll go on my phone, so it's risky. Hold on, yeah. Um, there's a, a great poet called Louise Gluck, and I thought... Uh, who's it by? Louise Gluck. Yep. And um, the poem is called Snowdrops, and it was a poem I read when I was still ill, and it's a poem about recovery. And it's not a funny poem or a silly poem, it's just a, it's, it's a, just a short, beautiful little bit of writing um, which really struck a chord with me um, when I was uh, coming out of depression. Do you know what I was? How I lived? You know what despair is. Then winter should have meaning for you. I did not expect to survive, earth suppressing me. I didn't expect to waken again, to feel in damp earth my body able to respond again, remembering after so long how to open again in the cold light of earlier spring. Afraid, yes, but among you again. Crying, yes, but risking joy in the raw wind of the new world. Thank you. So, okay. I was what about to check Twitter and I don't remember <laughs> where I was. <laughs> Somebody will be tweeting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, what is it that, I mean, here we are, I presume everyone here is some, a book de devotee of some sort. What is it about the words and the someone else's experience? What? How does that save us? Um, well, I I mean, how did that poem say, uh, help you? Well, because it's clear that she's been through something and that she's resilient, not necessarily because of it, but her resilience got her through that, and like it gives you that powerful image of a snowdrop. And I think metaphors are so important, for instance, with depression, because it's an invisible thing, so it's nice to talk about surviving through a storm or being a snowdrop or whatever it is, because it, it, it gives you, I don't know, there's just a... a, a, a hard to articulate power about that. I also think it's that thing of feeling less alone. It sounds so melodramatic, but it's a feeling lots of people have. Like when I first had a breakdown, I felt I'm literally the only person who's ever felt like this 
in life ever. That this is like the worst everyone's ever felt. I'm the only one who's felt like this. No one's meant to go through this. And then you hear of other people going through it, through it and worse and having this sort of happen. And um, it's a comfort. You don't want to hear all about rainbows and unicorns when you're going through that. You want to you want to have optimism, but you want it to to feel like it's been provided by someone who actually knows and who's been through stuff. And I feel like that that gives you so much power and nourishment and it gives me every time I hear a story of someone overcoming something that they thought they couldn't overcome or going through something you know even if it's just a, a celebrity on a daytime tv show or, or if it's a um a book or whatever it is it just gives you that um and I, I have it a lot at events you know like after an event you'll hear from people who have have been through all kinds of stuff and i even see it on like instagram like people who've messaged me and like message sending messages that i've had to get back to because they're in a like deeply suicidal place and think they literally ha was one person who had the pills in front of them and I thought, you know, I just can't give that person some hotlines. I've got to actually talk to this person and, like, to actually bring them down from that place. And then months later, s see that they've, you know, got into university doing what they want to do in this and they're in a totally different place and they couldn't imagine it happening. And ha hearing that over and over again, even though it's kind of intense, it, it makes you absolutely have incredible faith in the resilience of human beings. And I think often, you know, certainly when it's the first time someone's been ill with, say, depression, I think the dangerous thing is not having that perspective. And the more stories we hear, the more true stories, the more fictional stories from a real emotional place we hear, the more power we have. So I feel like stories genuinely, whether they're true or not, give you that power up. And so what I'm interested in what you said there is that, and you said it earlier too, trying to find the right words, and now you're talking about metaphor. Is it partly sort of just trying to sort of nail it and kind of yeah, totally. Name uh, and it. Uh, yeah, and I I'm s I I won't ever stop really. I don't think writing about mental health. I will write about other stuff and uh, write you know straight after Reasons to Stay Alive. I wrote about Father Christmas, which was the opposite <laughs> thing. Uh, although my editor, who's in here tonight, said, "Why have you made Father Christmas a depressive?" Uh, on the first <laughs> draft, so it wasn't that big. But yeah, I don't think I'll ever stop writing about it because I, I, I constantly feel like I haven't quite explained what I'm feeling. So it's a, it's, a no, it's a non-stop quest to try and pin it down and understand yourself and understand other people and mental health. Mm. I thought you wrote about, um, especially in the, the first book, Reasons to Stay Alive, I, I found I could really understand that incredible loop that you you were getting on from the anxiety to depression. I thought you wrote yeah. about that extremely well. Yeah, that pendulum feeling, yes. But I, yeah, it's still, it's still, you know, I still feel like you're getting a little bit deeper. But to get to the heart of it, I feel like it's a never-ending quest. Yes, and I don't know, I don't know um, if I ever will truly understand myself. But I'm, I, I've learned to enjoy the process. And one thing I, I've learned as well is to stop. I used what used to be dangerous for me was believing I would be better. I'd often feel like, mm. oh, I'm better. Yeah, and better I to me, to it was very binary. It was either like you were ill or you were well. And so I w I'd stop feeling as ill and I'd think, oh, so I'm well. And then like 24 hours later, I'd have a palpitation of heart, and it'd just be a little thing. But then I'd think, oh, so I'm not well, <laughs> so I must be ill. And then it'd start to spiral and spiral and spiral and think, oh, I'm back to square one, this, that, and the other. And so it was quite dangerous to believe in for me, being 100% better. And my recovery, I think, really was about accepting um, mental states that I hadn't accepted before. And so I'd get depressed about having depression. It was very sort of like a postmodern meta illness where you're, it's self-referential, so you'd get anxious about anxiety. You'd have panic attacks about panic attacks. And so you're constantly in this loop on this hamster wheel and it's incredibly hard to hack into your brain and get out of that. And you have to reach a point where you, of acceptance, of like, okay, I'm not better. There's not gonna be one thing I can do that will instantly make me better in like a minute. That's just not gonna happen. There's gonna be a little path of rising where I'll still feel ill and I've just got to accept it. And so I'm still on that path and yet, I've known far more happiness this side 
of um, being ill than I ever did before. And I'm even like grateful that I got ill because I wouldn't have become the person I am now. Like I feel like I am literally a different person to who mm. I was when I was 24. The, and I want to ask you one more question, then I'm going to open it to the, to the audience. Oh, no, we're going to have a tiny reading from you, too. Um, one of the, I would say, the heroes in, in this book is Andrea. Yes. She's His here. wife. She's here. <laughs> um, and your parents, obviously, too. And I, I suppose one, and there's probably a lot of people in this room who are either caring or, or aware of people who around them who need care. And I'd, I'd like you to just tell us a little bit more what other people can do to help. Um, yeah, like Andrea, I obviously mention her a lot in um, Reasons for Life. Um, I think people really struggle with what, what they can do for people because in a way, they're essentially limited because you to recover, it kind of needs, if someone really doesn't want, to re doesn't want to help themselves, it's incredibly hard to know what to do. I feel like Andrea helps definitely save my life and I feel like, what she did, she had no training. She had no, uh, you know, well direct. She was very young too at the she time. She was young, 24. We were, we'd been together for five years since teenagers, technically. But so it, it was a long, solid relationship for that age. Mm. Felt like, you know, an old married couple in that sense. And that gave me, our closeness gave me the freedom and her, you know, as a person, gave me the freedom to say what I was feeling like. And I was sometimes frightened of saying it myself. I was mm. stigmatizing myself. I thought, who am I? What is this person? And so having that freedom of someone where you don't have to wear a mask, you don't have to disguise your own self, you can actually just talk to them was great. And um, it gave me that valve, which I didn't always have, to be perfectly honest. I didn't even have it with my parents sometimes because I didn't want... I didn't want to bring, you know, they clearly had their own lives going on and their own stresses. It was only really at a certain point, Andrea, I had as a person, and it was a burden on her. And I have so, I have a lot of guilt about that period for her, because like her mid 20s were basically, she had a, a boyfriend who, before I came ill, you know, we, we'd argue because like I wanted to stay out, I wanted to stay carrying on drinking, we were in a beefer, and I was like, young and just hedonistic and wanting to party all the time. And then she went from that boyfriend to this boyfriend who couldn't walk to the corner shop mm. on their own. So I have a lot of guilt about that transition and how much, you know, I had separation anxiety, how much I needed to be with her. So as a drain on her resources and I, I, I you know, I, I, um, I still have issues with that. But yeah, it, it, it helped keep me alive to have somebody I could talk to. It wouldn't necessarily, in a, another person's case, it wouldn't necessarily have to be a partner, it could be a friend, it could be a parent, it could be a sibling or whatever. Um, it could even be a doctor or a therapist. But, you know, I was very lucky that I had that mm. escape route talk. And she was also the person who got me into writing because she said, write down mm -hmm. what you're feeling like now. Because there was a point there, like with depression, I, was, I literally felt like I couldn't move my tongue. I, I didn't have the words in my head. Everything was a jumble, but she gave me a pen and she said, write down what you're feeling. And so I started writing down what I was feeling. And it was like the lyrics to the very worst heavy metal song <laughs> ever written. <laughs> but it helped alleviate things and externalize them. Mm. Read us a tiny bit more and then we'll open the, to the questions. You Unplugged. Life can sometimes feel like an overproduced song with a cacophony of a hundred instruments playing all at once. Sometimes the song sounds better stripped back to just a guitar and a voice. Sometimes when a song has too much happening, it's hard to hear the song at all. And like that overcrowded song, we too can feel a bit lost. Our natural selves haven't changed in tens of thousands of years. And we should remember that with every new app or smartphone or social media platform or nuclear weapon we design. We should remember the song of being human, to think of the air when we feel stuck underwater, to find some calm amid an age of saturated marketing and breaking news and the million daily jolts of the internet, to be unafraid of being afraid, to be our own brilliant, true, beautiful, fragile, flawed, imperfect, animal, aging, wonderful selves, trapped in time and space, made free by our ability to stop at any moment and find something, a song, 
a sunbeam, a conversation, a piece of pretty graffiti, and feel the sheer improbable wonder of being alive. Thank you. So could we have the lights up, please? And we have mics, I know. Um, questions? Oh, there is one right there. And there's one right here. Where are you? Oh. Yeah. Right, okay, good. Fine, okay, we yeah. got one, two, and one here. Is this working? Yes. And I'll hello. come to you next. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi. Where are you? Yeah, oh, oh, sorry, hello. Hello, yeah, hi. Um, my name is Robert. Um, like you, I was very depressed when I was 25. Um, and a lot of things that I've, I was depressed about then have only got worse. Uh, climate change, for instance. You can probably see I've got an Extinction Rebellion patch on my jacket. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the things I've found is that um, it's actually, sometimes it's not your problem. Sometimes it is actually something that's out there in the world that is causing your problem. And that the best way to deal with is to do something about it yep. with other people. Um, so. How would you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting for me because like two things are sort of separate and sort of related. I mean, for me personally, it's, uh, it sounds really strange and almost twisted, but like sometimes when I have an external thing to worry about and climate change definitely is top of that list um, and it should be towards the top of pretty much everyone's list, um, I. I don't feel depressed in the sort of clinical sense. I feel depressed in the, oh my God, that is horrendous and we should do things about it. And, um, you know, working out exactly what we do about it, that's a collective effort and it's a divisive effort and we're still sort of working it out. Um, but, yeah, so, uh, like, for instance, like, when I, I, when I lived in New York, um, we lived by the river and our house was. Uh, increasingly prone to flooding and that this was a climate change related thing uh, uh, in York the river floods much more than it used to um, yet when our house literally flooded um, I, I was heading towards depression and then my house flooded and then my depression um, lifted because I had something external to worry about and I think it's not it's not that obviously disaster and catastrophe doesn't cheer you up but I feel like having something where you actually feel like you, you, you have to, you have to do something about, for me, is, is, is almost um, therapeutic. And I feel like, you know, it's probably a, 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 a great, great time for me to have depression because there's so, so many things that I could divert my own inner turmoil in, in terms of external turmoil. But I feel like definitely, I mean, climate change is something that I'm, constantly alarmed at how little I know it feels to people that we're having loads of coverage about climate change but I personally don't think or feel like we're having um, anywhere near enough I feel like Brexit has taken over everything and I, I, I'm a bit obsessed by Brexit as well but I feel like climate change you know if we don't if we don't if we burn the Amazon rainforest down and we don't have any oxygen to breathe then it doesn't really matter the level of Brexit that we have because <laughs> Brexit isn't going to give us any kind of oxygen and, you know, we're chopping down trees. So I, I, I am obsessed with it, I, I, but I, I differ to you in the sense that, weirdly, uh, I, I kind of like having any kind of external focus, even if it's a catastrophic one, to divert from inner stuff. Right. That's how we're going to save the world. <laughs> it's going to be... <laughs> yes, back there. Hi. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, so a fanboy moment and a question. Oh, where are you? Where, where Hi. So, hi. Sorry. Hello. Um, yes, I'm sure there's quite a number of us follow you on Twitter and have done for a long time. And we're here. Um, I had a really tough time a few years ago with anxiety and depression, and your writing helped get me through it. So thank you. Um, the closing passage of How to Stay Alive is something that brings me to tears every time I read it. Um, so the question is, when are they making it into a movie, Matt? <laughs> Well, which, which reasons to stay alive or how to stop time? No, oh, sorry, how to stop time. How to stop time. Um, I don't know. Um, they Benedict Cumberbatch bought the film rights uh, two years ago. I'm not, not allowed to say too much, but I, they, they, they had a screenwriter. They didn't like the script, but that screenwriter did. They've now got a screenwriter writing another script. Depends how good that screenwriter script is, whether it gets made. There is definitely going to be a film made of one of my books, but it's 
um, the Father Christmas book. That <laughs> <laughs> it's a boy called Christmas, which they have finished filming, and that, so I think that means they're going to make it, and that is going to be a film with Maggie Smith and Jim Broadbent and oh, um, nice. Kristen Wiig and who else? Sally Hawkins and, and various people in it, and uh, that they've just finished filming that in Prague, and it's amazing, and it's people have made Paddington, and I'm really honoured to be part of it. I didn't write it or anything, but um, so I can blame them if it's a terrible <laughs> film. But um, so that's happening, and hopefully that makes How to Stop Time more likely to happen if it's any good. So I don't know. We will see. But yeah, it, it, I'd like that. Yeah, that'd mm -hmm. be good. Okay, um, I've got you. I'm just going to line up two more people. Can you? There's someone here, and back there. Okay. Yes, go. Hi, hi, my my name's uh, Hamish. Oh, sorry, I'm really right rubbish here. at finding on, people. On oh, hello, you're there. Hello, I'm Hamish. Um, not that I'm stalking you, but I came to see your gig back at the Queen's Hall a few months ago. And oh, yes. I thought you were excellent, thank you. Uh, I, I was reusing some of my lame jokes. Don't worry, but I'll laugh yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was unwell last year. I had to take six months off my work, and I'm much, much better. And your writings helped me a lot. Um, a question I've had through that time, which I've tried to answer myself, and I'd appreciate your, your words on it, is... To what extent do you think happiness is a choice? Mm, nice question. Ah, uh, I, um, I, I, I don't think it's a simple choice. I, 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 I don't. I think what part of the problem is nowadays we almost expect happiness as like the d default setting, which it definitely isn't. Um, and w I don't think we're, you know, evolutionary psych psychologists talk about this a lot. How we're not actually designed for happiness necessarily. So I, I feel like happiness as a name is probably dangerous in itself. I feel like, you know, and certainly w when I was depressed, I wasn't really thinking about happiness much. I just wanted to be, inverted commas, normal or neutral. I just wanted to feel an absence of pain. You know, if, you if your leg's on fire, you're not thinking, Ah, oh, I really wish I was on holiday now, having a happy time. You just want your leg to stop being on fire. And so when I was like depressed, I just wanted an absence of depression. And um, but I feel like I feel like there are. I feel like there's choices in how we react to things. So I don't feel like depression is a choice. Obviously, I don't feel like happiness is a choice. Obviously, but I feel like. Um, we, what we do have control over is our response to things, which we can work on. For instance, I, I still have anxiety. I have anxiety right now. But whereas 10 years ago, I'd have pretended I had the norovirus and I wouldn't have turned up today. I now turn up and I manage the anxiety and I enjoy myself and I'm pleased with myself when I do it and meet, hopefully meet lots of you people afterwards. Um, but so there's choices in how we react to things. I don't think we found the perfect magic button um, for happiness. Um, I, I thought I had it last night after I had three Bloody Marys, and then I discovered this morning didn't have it. Um, <laughs> so, there's a question here. Hello, I'm right here. Hello. Uh, you're, you say you're anxious when you when you talk in public to an audience. Yes. Are you anxious when you Twitter to this even bigger audience that you don't see? It's no. It, why not? Don't know. I should be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think it's because it's not. It, I think there's something about face-to-face -face communication, and it goes back to us when we're in a tribe and being judged by people. It doesn't feel quite real, does it, the internet? No, that's the whole problem with the internet. Is it, it, it gives you a sense of connection without actually making you connected, which is why the most connected generation there has ever been is also the generation with the highest rates of loneliness, because the thing that we think feeds the connection doesn't actually fulfill it. So I feel in the same way, I don't quite, g I feel like I should be more nervous about Twitter. Because you get to a certain point and like you can say a tweet and then it'll end up in a, a newspaper or something. Well, you know, because journalists are so lazy now, they'll base an article around something mm -hmm. someone's tweeted. But yeah, I, I, I just uh, yeah. fire it off. And then I disagree with myself about five minutes later. And then someone <laughs> remembers something you tweeted like five years ago and they say, oh, don't like that. And you can't even remember what you tweeted like 10 minutes ago. So Sorry. <laughs> I know. I've, I, there's one part. This is why I'm liking oh, Andrea so got much. Over here. Let me just tell you this. In one part in oh, the sorry. book, Andrea goes by the, the, and you're on the computer, and Andrea goes by and says, "Matt, you know that makes you feel ill. Come, yeah. come to bed." Yes, I know, I know. <laughs> he says it, and doesn't. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yes, I wanted to ask you. 
Uh, you said your, your parents helped you and Andrea helped you. So is there anything that they did in particular uh, that helped you when you were in a very bad place? And also I wanted to ask you, since you got um, your anxiety and all that when you were in your 20s, there wasn't social media and all that. Why do you think there was a lot anxiety levels in people have grown so much? Okay, um, so, so first part, as I kind of answered earlier about, you know, ju just literally listening being the prime thing. You know, listening, I think one of the reasons why therapy um, is has the same success rates now as Prozac is because l that process of just listening to someone them externalizing it. Sometimes they don't necessarily want a an magic answer. They'd love it if it existed, but they know it doesn't exist. They just want someone to listen and look supportive and sympathetic. Um, the second part of anxiety rates rising, you know, it's a contentious issue again, because some people say, oh, anxiety rates aren't really rising because we've always had the same amounts of anxiety and depression. We're just talking about it more. It's becoming less stigmatized. I disagree with that. I think anxiety rates are rising because if you break down the figures, actually some things are rising much faster than others and the things that are ri rising the fastest are actually stuff that still have a massive amount of stigma attached to them so for instance um, self-harm eating disorders um, borderline personality disorder the things that are rising are still ha massively stigmatized and we know already that um, depression and mental, a lot of mental illness, it, like physical illness, is cultural. So, you know, Greenland's been in the news a lot this week because <laughs> a certain <laughs> idiotic American president <laughs> feels like he can just buy whatever he, he wants. Um, but Greenland has the highest suicide rate in uh, the world uh, by a long way, more than double the next country, which is Lithuania. And you know, there's, uh, there's all sorts of reasons for that in Greenland, partly to do with its place in terms of geography, partly to do with it being a relatively small community and it, it people are affected more by each other, partly because they've all got guns in their houses, um, rifles, uh, hunting rifles, uh, all kinds of things. But we know um, suicide is a cultural thing and a lot of mental health is cultural. So there is something about now and our cultural time behind, for instance, why um, the number of eating disorders have risen uh, in terms of hospital admissions, but have doubled in the last 10 years for both genders, uh, for uh, men and women, sorry, um, is because of, um, you know, uh, t cultural things like um, social media being part of that uh, in terms of uh, body image uh, and, and the images that people are seeing. I always find it interesting that the country of Fiji in the South Pacific never had a case of... Um, N never had a recorded case of any eating disorder like anorexia or bulimia before 1996. Then suddenly it started having increasing cases of eating disorders. And the only thing that changed in 1996 nationally in Fiji was uh, the arrival of state television and all they were showing on state television was American imported TV shows like Melrose Place and Beverly Hills 90210 and creating this new ideal of beauty, which was totally different to the traditional Fijian ideal of beauty, which was about um, being big and beautiful and size. And it was a compliment to say to someone, oh, look, you look like you've been eating well. That was a compliment to Fiji. And then suddenly everyone wanted to look like uh, Heather Locklear and blonde and skinny and Californian. And then suddenly eating disorders rose. So, so that's the clear idea of something that's cultural. But I feel like it's, it's too big a question and, too, and I'm, I'm conscious yes. that I'm over... The time. It's time, sadly. Sorry. Listen, I get to read the last tweet. Oh eight, um, August the 8th, 2019, 1956, 756. Reasons to stay alive, the play is coming to Sheffield, Bristol, Huddersfield, Newcastle, Manchester, York, and Leeds this autumn. That's gonna be so weird. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. That's you. So we're, we're heading to the book tent right here. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you.